message that Black Lives Matter has resonated around the world these past few weeks. If the death of George Floyd in Minneapolis was the initial spur, the subsequent response has been both reassuring and, frankly, extraordinary. In an MLS perspective, it's led to the formation of an organization called Black Players for Change. The aim Earl, thanks for taking the time. Um, you know, we hear a lot um, that racism, discrimination has no place, not only in our society, but uh, in our game and in our league and MLS. Um, what, what exactly does that statement mean to you? And how do you try to embody that every single day? Um, yeah, I think anytime you run into instances of discrimination and um, when people are treated a certain way because of how they look, their, their religion, their backgrounds, um, there's a lot of hate in that. Um, I think ultimately we're trying to create an environment here in MLS where um, guys can come to work and fully be themselves. Um, and if you're going to be judged for things that are simply out of your control or um, ultimately don't affect others, um, that's not the environment we're looking for. So um, to create an environment where we can bridge those gaps and um, really unify the player pool is, is what we're looking for more than anything. And I like to play my part in that by, uh, you know, making sure guys understand I'm there as a resource, whether it's through Black Players for Change or uh, as an e-board member with the PA. That's something that um, I've been very intentional about uh, doing whatever I can to make this a very inclusive environment. Yeah, and inclusivity for, for us as, as footballers, it's, it's the name of the game, quite frankly, and it's how you survive because throughout MLS specifically, any locker room you're in, it's gonna be extremely diverse and getting on the same page with your teammates, understanding the environment around you is just how we survive as, as footballers. Talk about why diversity in your locker room is a source of power and how you try to cultivate that power. Yeah, I think uh, it's a really good point. I think most uh, football leagues, you do run into a lot of diversity throughout teams. Um, I think specifically in MMLS, you run into it a lot. And, um, to uh, really uh, appreciate that diversity and dive into it, I think allows you to persevere through a lot of the ups and downs throughout a season. Um, guys come from different walks of life, have a lot of different life experiences, and um, to not dive into that unity and bring guys together um, will very much so work against you, I'll tell you that much. So, um, you know, it, it's it's easy to kind of stay within what's comfortable to you and and not bridge those gaps, but to be intentional about doing so. Uh, I think ultimately, you know, I was, I was just in Columbus and uh, saw the crew win their MLS Cup. And if you're watching these guys post game, there's guys from, again, all walks of life and you can see how close they are um, sharing. Uh, they're crying together. They're hugging each other. You could tell their families know each other um, and to see uh, that, that how unified um, they were, I think that's something that uh, clearly played out in their success. Yeah, I mean, in my opinion, football transcends all. Most sports do, they transcend racial boundaries, discrimination, they transcend, you know, differences in sexual orientation, religion, spiritual backgrounds. It doesn't, it doesn't seem to matter because when you put a ball down and you have 22 people going at it, it's, it's about things that are bigger than us as, as individuals, right? And for you, how have you specifically grown within the game of soccer in terms of empathy? How have you become more empathetic and how have you channeled that into positivity? Yeah, I think, um, I don't know if I've become more empathetic. I think that's something uh, I've had about me, but really finding um, that I'm in a society, first of all, in a country that's willing to progress. Um, and then very specifically, I'm in a league that wants to be um, in a position where they're known as being leaders in this space. Um, so I think w having the empathy is kind of the base of things. And, um, you know, for many, that's maybe something to be learned through, uh, unfortunately, witnessing times where players are put in situations where they are uh, suffering through acts of discrimination and you see their reactions and what they're going through. Uh, and at this point in time, I'm just thankful I'm in a league where um, not only can I just be empathetic, where I can speak up, I can help, I can be a resource. Other guys in the league um, can stand up for themselves and feel that they're 
there is an authority that cares and that will put an end to these things um, and create this environment that we're looking for. So um, I think more than anything, my experience in the league and throughout the league and how it's progressed, how our society's progressed, um, has allowed uh, myself and other athletes to really step into um, this world of advocacy and uh, generating an environment that we are um, would be grateful for here in MLS. And when you talk about you know us being in a in a greater society in America that that wants to 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 cultivate a, a better and more inclusive tomorrow or today rather, um, and most specifically, you talk about how MLS is um, a, a league that identifies as one that wants to be a champion and a leader in this space. How have you seen MLS grow into what you would class as a league that, that cultivates and, and allows players and fans and uh, organizations to, to weave that into who they are? Why do you think it's it's important for the league as well? Um, you know, I think um, in 2020, when we established Black Players for Change, um, that was a new experience for everybody. Uh, I think for us as uh, players in the league, uh, trying to formalize ourselves and um, become a stakeholder that uh, really has say in the environment we're playing in, uh, that was something that we were uh, cultivating on the fly while the league was also trying to figure out how to embrace that. Um, and not knowing how that was going to be handled to see how it has played out, how the PA has stepped in and uh, become a, a key player in um, helping us implement policy and different things. Um, I wouldn't say in negotiation with the league, I would say in collaboration with the league. Um, we've become a stakeholder that um, has been welcomed. And uh, with all that, I just, I've, I've really been able to gain the experiences that make me feel like the league cares about being a progressive league, um, a league that champions this space um, and truly will be a front runner. Um, I think not just in the soccer world, but North, North American pro leagues in general. Um, and hopefully really set a strong example for um, sports across the world. And what are some of the things um, that people may not be aware of that the league has, has implemented into either culture or law, or for lack of a better word, um, that has really allowed um, more spaces of inclusivity? Uh, I think the two biggest things for me uh, would be the diversity hiring uh, coaching policy. Um, while there's still room to grow there, there's an intentionality of trying to create uh, a coaching pool that reflects the player pool. Um, and I think representation goes a long way, um, whether that's kids watching the game and seeing athletes like myself and uh, wanting to fill our shoes or whether it's as players, we're looking at our coaches and how we can relate to them and seeing that representation. So um, the, the hiring policy, I think, has been a big one. And I think um, what we're trying to do to um, fight uh, discrimination issues on field. Um, unfortunately, over the last few years, there's been multiple incidents each year and um, uh, the Black Players for Change, we've come together with the league and the PA to figure out how we can really um, eradicate that from the game. Um, and it's been a work in progress. It's probably going to take um, a good amount of time for us to fully get to a point where this is completely out of our game. Um, but while we get there, it's um, trying to do it in a way where um, that unity um, is really the focus and the brotherhood is really the focus. And if someone is um, acting in such a way that goes against that, it's it's the idea of restoring him to a, um, uh, a camaraderie that we're looking for in this league and um, getting them the resources they need if someone is acting in such a way to get them the resources they need to understand um, what it is to be um, inclusive um, and um, a positive light in our, in our community. So I think um, the policy we're putting together to face those issues I think will be um, robust and allow um, everyone to feel like we are um, on the path to eradicating racism from the game and from the league. And eradicating racism is, is something that is very near and dear to your heart in terms of not just talking about it, but, but, but being there to do the work, being there to learn, being there to, to, to be a resource for others. You spoke about it 
Um, do you think the league has has grown and improved on how they've handled, um, you know, incidents of of either racial slurs being hurled at players during games or you know in and around a game setting? Yeah, I, th I think it's improved massively. Uh, you know, I think. Um, just their approach and their care for such incidents has has greatly increased. I still think there's room to grow in terms of, um, you know, what consequences are, um, what restoration does look like to restore individuals back to the community again that have done that wrongdoing. But um, while there is room to grow, I, I I have to point out that again both the PA and the league have made tremendous strides in um, wanting to address these issues, wanting to uh, address them quickly. Um, and really, um, you, you used the word earlier, be empathizing um, with these issues in, in a, at a deeper level and wanting to understand, um, I guess, what that pain is like and, and wanting to, um, cre again, create an environment where black players and uh, marginalized players, minority players do not have to deal with um, such acts. I really feel like they've been intentional um, about uh, how we can move in a way that's unique to anything that's been done before um, to really make players feel like this is a place they want to come play. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when we've seen these instances of discrimination, a lot of times they come in the form of, of uh, verbal slurs. Sometimes it's, it's online discrimination towards either players or, or coaches or, or whatever have you. When you see these things happen, what does it make you feel? And then what is your reaction in terms of what you feel you should do? Um, I think my reaction might be different than most, to be honest. Um, unfortunately, a lot of these incidents have come from players coming from overseas into our league. Um, and maybe using a, a verbiage that might be more common in their culture, their country, um, and then coming here and, and uh, maybe learning the hard way what's not acceptable. Um, and for me, you talk about empathizing where I feel like um, that's a deep part of my nature in the sense that like a lot of my feeling in those incidents, while I'll empathize with the individual that was the victim in that sense, I also empathize with the individual that is frankly unaware of where we are at as a society in America um, and what we're trying to build towards, um, specifically towards eradicating raci racism in our leagues and our society. And um, to come here and be uneducated again as to where we're at in that space um, and maybe use some verbiage that they've been using their whole lives, I empathize with the consequences that will inevitably be suffered um, using such, such, um, such a verbiage. So I think um, the uh, impact that I've uh, been working with uh, BBC and the PA to create and the league to create is, is one that not only addresses, um, not only addresses the uh, the desire to eradicate these things, but also addresses the desire to educate individuals that are stepping into uh, Major League Soccer. Um, and how do we get them to a place of uh, similar empathy uh, mm -hmm. and understanding what's acceptable, what's not acceptable, um, and uh, appreciating people's backgrounds and things of that sort. And I think that's something where um, we've even privilege here as Americans to maybe learn some of these things. Um, and it's, it's something that in MLS, we have a, an infrastructure where we have a, it's a real blessing to be able um, to implement this as an educational piece to athletes, um, you know, prior to the season starting. Um, so you don't run into issues where, uh, you know, a, someone like Vinicius is exposed overseas and everyone in his, in his locker room throughout the league is uh, extremely reactive and not sure how to respond to these things or that they don't have the infrastructure um, to educate and prevent these things from happening in the first place or they're just simply behind the eight ball in terms of getting there and i think that's the real um, blessing and privilege we have here in mls to be able to do those things 100 percent. and you've spoken a lot about empathy um you know universally empathy through everybody who's involved in these these unfortunate occurrences um, some people may say, you know, there's zero tolerance means if you do this, you're done. 
if you do that, you have no road to, to be in this ecosystem. Speak about restoration and why it's important and how it's in lockstep with education. Yeah, restorative justice is something that was proposed by um, Eric Harrington within the PA, and um, it was something that um, was at the very core of our nature in Black Players for Change. From the very start, uh, we didn't have the name for it, but we always felt that cancel culture is something that's detrimental um, to, the, to the progress we're trying to make. Um, people have to be allowed to make mistakes and recover, mm -hmm. um, even in uh, acts of discrimination, racism, things of the sort. For me, to, uh, to empathize with individuals that have suffered racism for, throughout the history of America, um, to look at that in a way of, how do I, how do I um, show our counterparts that um, essentially the FU is not being met with an FU. Mm -hmm. And as opposed to meeting it that way, you meet it with a like, that it, things can be hurtful. I was hurt by that. Um, I don't need you to uh, have the book thrown at you to learn um, why that's wrong. As opposed to the, the idea of restorative justice is um, how do we reform our relationships so we can have a brotherhood? Um, and as genuine as a, as a way to do that, and you know, to bring in um, a third party to help facilitate that, I think is, you know, when we run into these instances, you can have an individual make a mistake, um, suffer consequences, whether in terms of, you know, possibly missing games, and um, there's gonna be a lot of public scrutiny with these instances, and that is, a great form of punishment. Mm -hmm. um, but I think ultimately the goal is to educate the individual as to why that is so hurtful, um, why they should um, avoid such <laughs> hateful acts, mm -hmm. you know? And there's some people that it'll be too difficult to educate them. You yeah. know, maybe there is a real hate in their heart and that is what we're trying to eradicate from the game. If the individual can't pick up the concept as to why they are not better than somebody because of their background, race, religion, sex, whatever it is, um, that is an individual that might need to face the consequences of not being a part of our league. We don't want that here. Um, but I'm of the mind that a lot of guys can be educated and taught as to um, why certain things hurt, why certain verbiage hurts, why um, um, things, in our culture can be more hurtful than it is in their culture. And I think a lot of it, oftentimes, more often than not, it comes down to that. Someone, you know, in the heat of competition, maybe wanting to get back at someone or talk shit or whatever it is, mm -hmm. um, but ultimately they cross a line that I don't think they even knew was there. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the point of restoration is to educate them on what, that, what those lines are um, and to try to maintain the love, but, um, Again, if there's someone that doesn't care what those lines are and constantly wants to cross them, then yeah, they got to go. But ultimately, I think a lot of guys can just be educated um, and brought up to speed as to what's acceptable and what's the, the culture that we're looking for here in MLS. And man, you and I, we've worked together for years on end now. Countless hours, countless Zoom calls, countless meetings, countless random, yo, we got to get on a phone, get people together, da 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 moving at 100 miles an hour and we've become extremely close in a way that we would have never before, you know, the unfortunate instances in, in 2020. But we've never talked about this. Where does your empathy come from? Where does all this come from for you? Is it your parents? Is it your family? Is it coaches? Is it, um, you know, just who you are as a, as a person? Is it your, you know, your wife? What is it? But why do you consistently gravitate toward you know, creating a better tomorrow. And again, not just talking about it, but showing up every single day and doing the work necessary to allow people to understand truly where you come from within your heart. Um, yeah, I appreciate the question. Um, so growing, I am biracial. Um, my dad's black. He was born in Selma, Alabama in 1950. I encourage anyone to Google Selma, Alabama, 1950, you will see the pictures of police with fire hoses used against black individuals and um, police dogs, things of the sort. It's the stereotypical pictures you see from 
uh, the civil rights movement and um, in the Jim Crow era. Um, my mom's white, she was born in Northern uh, New Jersey and um, just typical white American family, um, middle class. Um, and that was her background. I, and my dad, um, has gone on to be a very successful athletic director at a university and um, my mother is in the medical field and um, she she grew up in uh, the way she grew up she just constantly gravitated toward the black community mm -hmm. um, and empathized with the black community I think a lot of my empathy comes from um, my mom and things that she saw growing up that she wanted to make an impact on. Um, and then having my dad go from where he was born to where he um, ended up, I understood how he had to navigate certain spaces uh, to make it to such a level. Um, but on a more personal level, I, I played soccer and basketball growing up um, in the basketball world. I played for an AAU team in inner city areas and um, I was very much so at best the light-skinned guy on the team <laughs> at best the light-skinned guy on the team but I, I, you know, you know well the funny thing is like I, I very much I was getting roasted by those guys you know like I just I, I was they knew I was black, but I was light skinned and they would crush me for it. But I enjoyed it. Like I loved being in that environment. Yeah. Um, it was very much so different than the soccer environment I was in. My soccer environment, I had a lot of white and uh, Mexican teammates. Mm -hmm. um, and in that space, I was very black. Mm -hmm. um, and how I was treated or looked at in each space, um, I still felt I could thrive in each space. Right. And I also felt that the gap between the two spaces isn't as big as people feel in society. Mm -hmm. um, and I think being biracial played a big part in that. And um, so for me, I think the, the empathy and my desire uh, kind of came from witnessing things of um, where there is a divisiveness, where I'm living between both worlds and understanding that the gap is, isn't as big as it should be. And um, I think at a young age, without thinking about it intentionally, I kind of started to feel these things of like, how do, like, I, I've, I can see that there, this can be bridged, this can be meshed. Mm -hmm. um, and as I got older, I started, to, I studied African-American history at UCLA um, and coming out of UCLA, um, these are things that have always just been a passion of mine. I, I studied the 1968 Olympics um, in depth. Um, we got connected with Dr. Harry Edwards who organized that uh, protest. We got connected with him going into uh, the bubble and the, and the protests we carried out there and uh, to reconnect with him from a book report I did in seventh grade. Um, this was something that I think subconsciously was a deep passion of mine. And then uh, to your point, the events in 2020 unfold and we start to come together as a brotherhood. And um, I wasn't like, oh, here's my opportunity to step into this space I've always wanted to. Yeah. I just naturally felt compelled to speak on it. And um, I really saw the opportunity to start to bridge this gap in the world and space that I was living in here in MLS. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think all those things, those experiences I had growing up, um, seeing the success of my parents and um, the worlds they came from and thrived in and came out, came out of and um, a lot of my upbringing, I think it all just kind of culminated into this really massive opportunity to create an impact here in MLS and it's something I've stepped into wholeheart wholeheartedly. It's amazing. That's amazing. Talk about what you love most about being biracial. Um, I was just talking to uh, Justin Morrow about this and I think um, being exposed to different cultures at a young age. Um, I think it's something I took for granted up until like honestly I don't think I consciously started thinking about this until like the last year or so. Um, but I think being biracial, you, I was telling Justin on, on Christmas Day, my family um, was in New York and New Jersey. I had the ability to see both my mom and dad's side of the family on Christmas Day. Um, so I would spend the morning at my mom's side, my white side of the family. And in the afternoon, I'm at my dad's side of the family. And I'm in two completely different cultures in the same day and both feel like home to me. 
but it's completely different. And I, uh, while I feel on myself in both rooms, like it is a different space. I can, I can recognize that. And, um, you know, I wouldn't go as far as saying like I code switch within my family, but I would say um, that I figure out how to navigate those rooms slightly differently for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and I think just having those experiences of, that was just normal to me, being in different cultures, different backgrounds, it was my family. Yeah. Um, so diversity just seemed normal to me. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's an ex a beautiful privilege that I have and something that I, um, I don't, I wouldn't say an obligation, but just something I feel compelled to share with the world that these acts of discrimination, like we're, we're all human, like we're much closer than people think and we can right. bridge those gaps um, just based on human to human connection, not ignoring what makes you who you are and your background and whatnot. I think those things should be, should be appreciated, but ultimately, dropping the judgment and seeing people for who they are. 100%, man. I mean, you talk about living in two different worlds, um, being biracial for you. A lot of people don't know or maybe not um, see on the surface, of course, for me, my diversity within my household, my family doesn't come through race, but it comes through culture, background and history. My dad was born and raised in Lagos, Nigeria. My mom is from Vallejo, California. So when you talk about Christmas day, completely different, mm -hmm. completely different. And then my stepmom is white. My stepbrother is, is half yeah. like you. Yeah. Um, so when I'm with my dad's side of the family, there's part of it that's Nigerian. He's on the phone calling people, you know, he's three rooms away, but you can hear him like he's right next to you, mm -hmm. that vibe. Mm -hmm. And then you also have the white part of the family, that culture, mm -hmm. and that's all in one household. Mm -hmm. And then when I go to the Bay on my mom's side, I'll say it straight up, we code switching. Mm -hmm. We talking different. Mm -hmm. And it's an amazing thing. Mm -hmm. What I've seen firsthand is that when you mesh multiple cultures together, you can get the best, if you do it the right way, you can get the best of the two given cultures to combust together mm -hmm. to make something more beautiful. Mm -hmm. You know, because there is no culture, there's no experience that is, that's total and, mm -hmm. and perfect. Mm -hmm. But when you mix them together though, mm -hmm. and you have love, you have empathy, mm -hmm. you get some amazing stuff. Yeah. So I wanna talk to you about being an ally, standing up for people. Mm -hmm. A lot of the conversations that we talk about within BPC and what we are outwardly standing up for is our people is the struggle of, of you know, black players. Why is it important for you to stand up for, for anybody who is either discriminated against or disenfranchised within our league and out? Yeah, I think it's a great question. I think um, uh, stepping into this space of advocacy stemmed from wanting to fight for my people specifically, for black people. Mm -hmm. um, I think the history of our country uh, and how black people have been marginalized and how intentional that has been um, has really compelled me to want to fight for my people in that space. Yeah, I was, I was ultimately compelled by wanting to fight for my people and then getting to a point where um, understanding by doing that, I'm going to create an environment that's inclusive for all. I'm, I'm speaking about for in my experience and what I've seen, again, in the history of our country, I'm fighting for the most marginalized group I see. Mm -hmm. And by doing that, inevitably, we'll kind of catch everything else in that. And um, I don't mind to, I don't, I don't mean to do that as like, oh, it's just gonna be a byproduct. I think that happened early on, it was a byproduct, and now there's a real intentionality to be in that space for everybody mm -hmm. um, and wanting to be and wanting to have Black Players for Change be a resource for everybody um, in any type of uh, realm of anti-discrimination or lack of equality, um, or ultimately as a player, just feeling like you're not in a space where you feel totally included. Um, I think that's what um, I've really felt is rewarding in this space. Again, fighting for Black Players 
was um, maybe why it started. And now at this point in time, while that's still very much so my focus, I'm very intentional about making sure I'm creating an environment that's inclusive to all. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing. We got a few more minutes, but you, you have always been that guy in BPC where it's, this is not just about us. Anyone who comes and interacts with BPC um, in a, you know, a heartfelt way, wanting to either learn or be involved, you've always been like, yo, get them on the call, get them on board calls. Members don't have to be black, they, they could be whatever. Um, just as long as you, you ride with the highest levels of empathy, good humanity for all people. Um, and that's, all, that's always been you. Um, and I think that's a whole nother level, in my opinion, of, of, uh, of activism. It's a whole nother level of, of humanity because even with, within the black community, there, there has been, you know, uh, very well documented groups who don't want anything to do with helping anyone else. Mm. But that hasn't been you. Um, and I think that people need to understand how important that is. Um, I think you, you need to take a pause and give yourself some grace for that, for real. Um, but talk more about where you want not only your your individual ability to to deliver impact, but where you want BPC, the Players Association, and the league to collectively go from here. Yeah, so um, you covered quite a bit there. I do want to touch on a couple of things because I think it's important. I, I want to circle back to our initiation and having a protest in the bubble. Mm -hmm. um, I do feel like there were players at the time that felt like they were excluded mm -hmm. from participating. Um, and it was a black player initiation um, and protest. And I, it, in that moment, at that point in time and things that were occurring in 2020, um, I think it was a very unique circumstance where as black athletes, we felt we can come together, speak on our own behalf and be heard, mm -hmm. um, heard in a way, in a real way that we can generate an impact for ourselves um, in our league and ultimately in our society. So I'll stop you there so you can further uh, elaborate on this point. Why are the two things not mutually exclusive in terms of when you're celebrating yourself and it's just black players? Why is that not mutually exclusive with being um, uh, delivering an olive branch to bring everyone into what you're doing. Yeah, I, I just think at, at, at that point in, t in time, again, it was just a really unique circumstance mm -hmm. um, to be able to go to a tournament all together. Um, the uh, murders that were happening throughout the country where I thought it was, or I, I'll say we felt as black players, it was really important for us to have that platform and speak out. Um, looking back, I, I love that we executed it the way we did. And I think moving forward, um, I, I, I'll say coming out of that, I didn't like the fact that people felt excluded, mm -hmm. um, but I also felt it very important for us as black players to have a a platform to speak on our own behalf. Yeah. Um, so I don't regret how we handled that and how it played out. Mm -hmm. But I will say hearing that people felt excluded and uh, maybe wanted to participate in such a movement for me was like, well, we just kicked it off. Now let's go. Like yeah. anyone that wants to be a part of this is something that I think we quickly realized is what we've always wanted and desired to have individuals across the league from all walks of life and backgrounds wanting to fight on behalf of back players, but ultimately for a, a world that is just more inclusive, a league that's more inclusive, is something that was uh, undeniable for us to to want to bring in to our organization. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's something that is is still a work in progress. 
I think now, like, I, this is cool because I think we're really getting into like the nitty gritty of this. I think yeah. you have you have black players that were feeling a certain type of way, maybe have felt a certain type of way their whole life living here in America, sure. that wanted to lash out, say something back, do something about it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, uh, well, even when we heard when other individuals wanted to be a part of it, that was a tough concept for us to grasp. Right. Hearing people ma being mad about not being a part of it was like, I met it with some of us, myself included, it, it was like, well, F you, F you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and that's how it, what, there was a friction there. And, and again, I don't regret utilizing the platform the way we did, but I think there was lessons to be learned coming out of it of like, okay, we have people that want to ride with us, that want to do this work with us, um, that are also interested in, in creating such an environment where everyone feels included. Um, and how do we dive into that? And I think that's something that, um, again, I, I don't regret it because in a, in a sense, I almost think it was a learning lesson for us. I don't, I don't think we, even to this day, would have done it differently. I think it was really important for us to unify ourselves mm -hmm. and show that we have a voice and that we will stand up for ourselves. If we're marginalized, we will stand up. You will hear us and we will fight back. We're not going to accept this level of what we're at right now. Mm -hmm. I think that was really important for us, but to hear that people wanted to support, I think it was also really important for us to then, okay, we, we said that with the level that we wanted to say it, we were heard, we were seen. Now we have to show that this is the inclusiveness that we want. Right. And to do that, you have to live it, you have to speak it, you have to, to be that every day. And I think for Black Players for Change, that's been really important for us. Someone that's interested and wants to be included, you gotta lead by example. And I think um, uh, that's always been our goal to try to in build an inclusive environment, an inclusive league, and with that, it starts from within. And we've always wanted to, um, you know, bring on our allies and, and have as many people uh, along for the ride in this fight as possible. Yeah, follow through is, is key. It's it's everything. We had a vision, but without the follow through, without the the you know willingness to to really put in the work um, to to let people know who we are, what we're about, um, and why it's important that you know everybody knows and they feel and they can act on being included in and in what we're talking about and what we are doing is huge. But again, the two things are not mutually exclusive. A group, black people can, can say, at this moment in time, we need to stand as black individuals and say to the world, this is us. That doesn't exclude people if you create um, a place for, for people to, to ride with you. So that's a part of, of BPC that I'm extremely proud of um, and how that's been you know, doubled down on by not only us and BPC, but but the PA, but the league, and the goal is to to create more inclusivity for for everybody. Um, it's not a a scarcity mindset where it's okay. Black people need more of this, so that means we got to take from something else or from someone else. It's we all need more. We all need more spaces to to talk. We all need more levels of empathy. We all need more um, ability to to be exactly who we are. So. Yeah, I, and I think uh, all of it, I think for all of us is like, there's such a, this is all new to everybody. You know, like historically we're coming from a, a country that had a great deal of racism, marginalization, um, and reversing that is gonna be a like massive learning curve you know i've never been um a revolutionary and i very much so feel like i am in the sense now but i i i'm learning on the fly i'm the president of black players for change like i was never the president of a black advocacy group mm -hmm. and it's new to me mm -hmm. you know and so there's things that um i'm learning but learning in the sense of like okay if the base is empathy and inclusivity, I'll, I'll, as long as I'm moving with that and guys are moving with that and interested in really cultivating that, how we get there is, is like, we're all building this track together. I don't like, right. we, none of us know exactly how we're going to get there. We have a lot of people in the PA or in the league that have these experiences from different organizations and 
success they've had there, successes we've had for, as black players for change. But if we're trying, to, we're trying to champion this, we're trying to be pioneers in this space as a league, as an organization, as players. If you're the first, it's because there's no other path. Mm -hmm. And so right. we're not always going to be perfect. We're not always going to make you feel like we're the most inclusive, but that is the goal. And it, it's, a, it, it's a fight for a reason. It's going to take some time to ultimately get to achieving our goal. Mm -hmm. um, and again, moving with that empathy, if someone screws up or falls short at a, at, at a time, like that's going to happen. You know, if the league is maybe a little too soft on a punishment and it's like, well, hey, that wasn't the standard we're looking for. Mm -hmm. And you have to give grace with that and let the league grow. Um, individuals can call someone something and you have to give grace with that, in my opinion. You know, the victim needs time and space to recover and heal, but also the, the person that's throwing out such hate, let's give them space to, to heal and learn. And, um, you know, I, I, and again, to be specific, for those that felt maybe they haven't been included or invited into BPC, our intention has always been inclusivity, moving with love and trying to generate this empathy and care for every player in this league. And if we've, if we've missed or fallen short or, or haven't gotten there fully to maybe the way people think we should, we're still growing. We're still like, we're, we're gonna get there. Everyone's gonna get there. And I just think that grace, empathy, love, as long as you're moving with that as a society, like it's, it's gonna be a constant progression. You know, so I think that's uh, ultimately why we established the organization we did. Um, and I think that's, that's, it's like, a, there's a lightness to it. I don't, I don't feel pressure to get it right or please people or like, oh, like, th did you all get the punishment right on this one? And it's right. like, ultimately, we're trying to create this brotherhood. It's going to take time approach it in a sense of people can make mistakes, give grace and be restored to the community. It's, it's, it's a lot to reverse, um, but I think we're on the right path and to just trust that, tap into it, ask questions, um, and everyone can really play a, a, a strong role in having an impact in this space. I think as long as people feel comfortable speaking up, I think more than anything, that's the environment I've tried to create in the locker rooms I'm in is speak up and make a mistake when you speak up. Like you can say the wrong thing, just asking a question or shoot, maybe you meant it, mm -hmm. but now I can educate you. But I think creating an environment where people can feel themselves, express themselves and learn what it is to be an environment that is fully inclusive. Like we haven't had that, an environment that's fully right. inclusive. What we're talking about, it sounds amazing and a league that eradicates race, all of it sounds amazing, but it's never been done before. Right. And you're going to see those things happen. So how do you meet it in a way that's, again, with grace and uh, with a light that is like, ah, it's like you made a mistake, your kids can make mistakes, friends make mistakes, but you recover and you move on in life. And I think that's what we're trying to gain here is as long as the base isn't so hateful and you can be taught to not discriminate, to love, to understand cultures differently, mm -hmm that mindset will allow us to, to fully obtain the lead that we're looking for. But grace, time, there, again, there's a lightness to it. It's not, you gotta get it right and you gotta be perfect, but understanding we're moving toward this, this culture that brings everybody in. 100%. And in closing, leave us with your short message of positivity that you want um, to seal all of this with. Short message of positivity. Um, I wish I had that one written out <laughs> and thought through. Um, I don't know. I feel like I could say something really corny, like love thy neighbor. And it's something you may have heard before. And it's kind of like, okay, like, I guess respect the person next to me. Um, if you're applying it to guys in your locker room, it's like, okay, I can have a general respect sure but i think it's taking it a step further to i'm not saying uh you know you have spanish speaking guys on your team so you have to go learn spanish sure. um but if you were to pick up a little bit of spanish that bridging of that gap they they feel uh, a spanish player a spanish speaking player would feel seen mm -hmm. um 
and appreciate you closing that gap. So when I say love thy neighbor, I'm kind of looking at it as like, figure out how to relate to your neighbor, how to see them, what are the similarities or what is different about them? Maybe there's something different about them that's really cool. I have players that are, I've played with a Japanese player on my team and I really want to go to Japan and like stay with his family and appreciate his culture and see what's out there. I think more often than not, uh, we're in these really unique circumstances where guys are coming from all over the world. And it's like, just see what you can appreciate from those different cultures. When I, so when I say love thy neighbor, like tap in and just see what they're about. Take it a little step further. You're not just like, it will translate to the field. Um, but ultimately, like even deeper, like just those per personal connections, like it's rewarding. And you take that time with someone and bridge those gaps. We're really not that different, regardless of race, religion and things of those backgrounds. So even if there's a language barrier, you could find a way. I know guys, I know guys that I play with that like, I'm like, yo, how are you so close to him? He don't even speak English. And they're like, oh, we kind of find a way. I'll like hint at things, whatever. But again, take things a step for further and bridge those gaps with your teammates. And I guess in a, a phrase I've never really used, but it just came to me now and makes sense. But love that neighbor, I guess, is, is what I'd go with. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Appreciate you, bro. Appreciate you. Yes, sir. Hey, yes, sir.